Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. We're going to start off first by looking at the last 72 hours of total accumulated precipitation as measured by radar here across the United States. And you can see from parts of eastern Texas all the way through parts of Michigan, Wisconsin, and over and back into Minnesota, we saw some extremely heavy rainfall. This morning, the heavy rain stretches all the way from the Gulf Coast into the Ohio River Valley and is still pounding Michigan where we do have flood warnings. What I'd like to do next though, is I'd like to add this to the previous day's precipitation so you can see the whole of the last week. And there are several regions across the country that have received in excess of three to six inches of rainfall. This has been an extremely wet past week for a, a corridor here stretching again from Texas through Illinois up into Michigan. Now when we take a look at where that heavy rainfall we need to remember what the soil moisture conditions look like as we go into the weekend. So this goes back to May 16th and what we saw was where that heavy rain stretched in through this area uh, we certainly saw that soils were already saturated which is what increased our flooding threat. Now places that needed this rainfall from Colorado right in through this narrow quarter and through here. While some of these locations did get the needed rainfall, uh, it was not enough to kind of overcome some of the major soil moisture anomalies that we had in that area. Meanwhile, some of the heavy rainfall that hit the western United States certainly was working away on the drought there in parts of northern California. And then some thunderstorm activity over the weekend in Oregon and Washington, helping with that region as well. And if we just go take a look here, I just pulled some pictures here from my own backyard in Illinois. This is from North Central Illinois. Bill, thank you for posting this. Uh, just shows you what that heavy rainfall looked like as it came through Illinois. And Ron over in East Central Illinois, it looks like he took his drone up on Sunday evening after the storms went through. And I can confirm that this is what a lot of East Central Illinois looks like. And I'm assuming much of the rest of Illinois looks like as well, as we were hammered by rainfall over the last seven days. New Train's own Andrew Pritchard was out observing the storms, keeping a close eye on their potential impacts on farm ground across the state here. What we can see is he did uh, get a, a picture here of the tornado that moved near Macon, Illinois. Uh, thankfully, didn't do a lot of damage, but as that storm went through, it added to the rainfall that you can already see uh, in this field. So again, if we come back to our map that shows the last seven days of total accumulated precipitation, and I isolate those regions that at least had two inches, you can see a broad sector right in through here that had some very, very heavy rainfall as did parts of the western United States. If I just broaden this out a little bit more and show you who had one inch of rainfall over the last week, we can see this map uh, does show a significant part of farm ground in the middle part of the United States did get that rain. But there were places that needed it, like I said, that did not get it. Specifically, take a look at these two maps. Last 30 days and last 14 days of precipitation expressed as a percent of normal. Now, these maps are from the HPS, which means they're only valid. Uh, they're always one day lag. So this goes back to the to yesterday's Sunday morning. We can still see parts of the Central Plains getting right in through this corridor that could have really used quite a bit more precipitation. I'm specifically talking about this part of Nebraska and Kansas, pockets in Iowa, this section of South Dakota that needed quite a bit of rainfall. Where the rainfall was beneficial was in this part uh, of, of, um, of Wisconsin. Now, what's interesting is we need to get quite a bit more rainfall to come into parts of the southeast, which has been dry the last couple of weeks after being very wet at the start of the last 30-day time period. And again, the western United States showing up very, very dry in these two images. Okay, where do we have the rainfall this morning? Well, we got the heavy rainfall coming through parts of the Sacramento Valley into the Sierra Nevada and along coastal Washington. You can see the overall flow of that broader wave, though. We're going to watch that one carefully. Come over here to the east. What we have is storms stretched all the way from the Gulf Coast, and we're just running these things straight north-south in through Indiana, into Michigan, going to hit the Ohio River Valley pretty hard. And here is Arthur. Before I leave this image, if you live in this area, we could have a few days, several days to the beginning of this week, that are going to be quite dry and at times quite windy. So what are we watching? Well, Tropical Storm Arthur's got the Tropical Storm warnings here. We have flood watches out for this area with flood warnings embedded in it. We will see this map evolve to show flood warnings and watches over this area very soon. Meanwhile, out west, as the deep trough comes in, flood watches in the Sacramento Valley, winter storm warning the Sierra Nevada, but look, get just on the other side of the mountains. This is all red flag warning. There's fire threat in this area, and we're going to be seeing the, the winds race out of the southwest as this deeper trough again coming through here pulls into the central plains giving us an unsettled week 
toward the end of this week. Quickly on Arthur, Arthur over the weekend watched the model forecast evolution keep the main track of Arthur offshore, but we do have tropical storm warnings up here through parts of coastal North Carolina. Again, you can see where Arthur is projected to move over the coming days completely beneath the upper level ridge that is now going to be pushing into uh, parts of the Canadian Maritimes. You can see it right here. Now watch this pattern. A week ago, last Thursday when we were talking about this, we had this hint that this pattern this week is going to set up into Omega, an Omega block possibly, where the jet stream was going to be um, possibly coming back around into a cutoff flow here. But what's interesting is the flow pattern really did cut that low off and it's sitting here and spinning over Illinois today. See the ridge out west? That's the dry conditions. That's the warm conditions. See the trough along the west coast? That's what keeps things unsettled in through this corridor before this whole pattern finally moves. But it's going to take its dear sweet time. This is today. Look tomorrow. Where does that cutoff low go? It just slowly moves here over parts of, well, right on the border between Tennessee and Kentucky. And the ridge builds in behind it. How about the next day on Wednesday? Well, the low is still sitting and spinning over there, now sitting over again, like near Louisville. And then by the time we get into Thursday, this is where that upper level trough finally kicks in here. It's going to open the Gulf of Mexico up for possibly a very stormy end of the week and weekend. So this is Memorial Day weekend, stormy for the Central Plains over into the Corn Belt, Eastern Corn Belt, as this low finally gets kicked out here. But this pattern is stagnant through much of this week until that deeper trough gets into the High Plains. So let's watch it do that by looking at winds first. Today, the low sitting here, you can see, sorry, the low sitting right there, you can see around it, the flow coming like this. Meanwhile, the deeper trough bringing in very windy conditions in through these areas. This is why our fire threat is high here, and there is Arthur. So let's go from the peak winds on Monday afternoon to the same thing on Tuesday afternoon, and it's not much changed. The low is now here. Strong winds coming out of the, the mountains and then up the high plains here, as you can see, but not too much of a change overall. It's not until we get into the day on Wednesday. I'm going to watch this corridor right in through here for the chance for severe weather as we rebuild the moisture, bring back in the heat. And if we just watch how the precipitation accumulates throughout this week, take a look at this animation from the European model. The cutoff low soaking the eastern corn belt, Arthur getting off the coast there, flood threat increases over parts of the Appalachian Mountains. Then by Wednesday, we see the storms blow up in the central plains. The trough moves. Finally, we see the thunderstorms return to the central United States and for Memorial Day weekend work their way to the east. But as you saw here, look at this. If I just take you back through, let's just get out to Wednesday afternoon and evening here. We can see that it's the cutoff low that dominates this section of the country. Very dry in the mid part of the United States. And our storms don't start to emerge here again until Wednesday night here. Meanwhile, that trough keeps things very unsettled out west. Uh, very uncharacteristic for this time of year. So let's take a look at what the Storm Prediction Center is looking out for here. We got today, the 18th, moving over to the 19th on Tuesday and finally on Wednesday. Our first broad threat of strong to severe storms does emerge on Wednesday uh, right here in the High Plains. You can see right on the border of the Dakotas, Minnesota, uh, excuse me, Montana, uh, and, and um, getting back into western Nebraska and Wyoming. From there, though, let me show you what our uh, thunderstorm index looks like. So here we are. This is, again, on Wednesday evening. That's that corridor there. I told you to watch uh, the return of the well, basically the destabilized atmosphere into this quarter. So this again is Wednesday evening. Let's pause it here for Thursday evening. Okay, see the broad sector opening up? That's an area we need to watch out for strong to severe storms on Thursday evening. As we work our way then into Friday, so this is now getting into Friday afternoon and evening. Again, the return of moisture. We have a much broader sector of the United States capable of thunderstorm activity. So this is where we're going to be watching, all right? And then going from Friday into your weekend on Saturday. So let's now get here. This is Saturday evening. That's when that wave has moved out. The trough uh, has opened up the Gulf of Mexico. So you can see where we're watching toward the end of this weekend, our greatest threat for thunderstorm, uh, our thunderstorm environment evolving. Okay. So from here, I want to do a bit of a model compar comparison. On the left, I have the GFS and on the right, the European. So we can see how these models stick together and how they diverge. We've already talked a lot about what's going on over the next couple of days. So working way through Tuesday afternoon and evening, we see the rainfall really widely scattered in through this section of the Eastern Corn Belt getting down to the Mid-South. European model on the same track here. There is Arthur, west unsettled. Let's go from there into the day on Tuesday. As we get into Tuesday, very windy conditions, 
right in through here. The upper level low still bringing in the precipitation. Both models have it. As we go from Tuesday afternoon into Tuesday evening, now working our way into Wednesday morning, afternoon, and evening, this is where we start to see the storms erupt right here in this high plains getting up to the northern plains. Both models picking up on it. Meanwhile, still very wet in this area from our cutoff low. From Thursday, excuse me, Wednesday evening, now working into the morning on Thursday, Thursday afternoon. Look at this. We have snow for the uh, parts of the Canadian prairies, possibly getting pretty far to the north here, but some snow in the forecast. And it's at this point that we've now opened the Gulf of Mexico up for the moisture transport and the thunderstorm threat that moves back into the high plains and central plains and southern plains for Thursday night. As we work our way into Friday, we get that same setup. Look over at the European model. Right in through here is the corridor on Friday afternoon evening. We're going to watch carefully for the strong to severe storms as the moisture rebuilds and the temperatures come with it. The models begin to diverge as we get into Memorial Day weekend. With the European model keeping a much broader sector out here open for thunderstorms, the GFS is not as though it's not doing that, but it's trying to bring out a much tighter low, much quicker into Kansas and Nebraska uh, and pulling that one pretty far to the east much quicker. So I'm going to stop here with doing the model to model comparison. And what we're going to do next is see why they diverge beyond that. Well, as we look out here toward the end of May, I've got your 10 day forecast. So we're out here now to May 28th. The GFS wants to dive a deep trough into this area. Okay. The European wants to bring in a ridge into the same area with the trough sitting over Texas, much farther to the north in terms of the flow in the European. What's the significance between that difference? Because you can see they both pick up on similar features outside of the United States, quite consistent there. But across North America, those differences give us this in the week two precipitation pattern. So this gets us out to Monday, June 1st. With the GFS bringing that open wave in through here, it keeps this broad sector on the lookout for, well, more precipitation and also potential for thunderstorm. As we look over here to the European, with the trough cutting down like this, it opens up that same corridor we just saw to heavy rainfall from Texas through parts of the Delta getting up into the central and eastern Corn Belt. Keeps a much broader section here on the drier side of things. So we have something to watch carefully throughout this week to see which of the dominant features take over and control our week two precipitation patterns. As we work at the end of this video, let's talk about temperatures, where our cutoff low sits and spins today. Much below average temperatures here in the central and western Corn Belt. You can see here, while highs will still be getting into the 60s, upper 50s and lower 60s, still quite cool. Where we have the windy conditions coming out of the south. Look at the warmth here compared to normal. Playing this forward, let's get from here into Tuesday. We see that low just sitting and spinning over parts of the east central Corn Belt. And then look at California dealing with that trough much cooler than average. Wednesday's highs and departure from normal. Thursday, this is where things begin to open up. See the warmth returning here? This is where we're going to watch this area Thursday and then again into Friday for the potential for our broader thunderstorm environment. Going from Friday into the weekend, it's going to be cool in the northwest, as you can see, or cooler than average. But the temperatures really rebound for the Memorial Day weekend, Saturday into Sunday for a broad sector here east of the Rocky Mountains. And overall, this is a pretty darn good picture to paint for Saturday into Sunday in terms of temperatures across the whole of the United States. Going from there, looking out longer term, 6 to 10 day forecast, got the GFS on the left, European on the right. And you can see the differences as I show you the 6 to 10 day and then get out to the 11 to 15 day in that the European wants that trough here, keeping it cloudy, cool, and wet, whereas the GFS much farther to the north with the trough, broader, therefore not such deep, cool colors, and keeping things very active in this section of the United States for the potential for thunderstorm activity. To finish this up, I want you to pay attention to this map here, which is showing you winds about a mile above our heads. I want you to focus in on those trade winds there, and also the tropical system in the Bay of Bengal. Why we're watching that tropical system carefully is, it is forecast to be quite powerful and go right up here into parts of eastern India and into Bangladesh. Now, as it does so, it is potentially going to be putting down tremendous amounts of rainfall. Measured in inches, we're talking about a quarter in here of 6 to 15 inches of rainfall as this all slams into the uh, Himalayan mountains. Now, just so you know, I'm kind of circling Bangladesh here. That particular country is about the size of Illinois, uh, whereas Illinois has, what, 13 million people? Bangladesh, I think, has 140 million people. So where the um, Ganges River and the Brahmapurta come together, major flooding here. It looks just like the Delta 
Delta in the southern part of the United States. Real quick, over here in China, Beijing is here. Notice how dry things are in a broad sector in and around Beijing, but very wet in southern China and wet in the northern Korean Peninsula. And another thing to take note of, I showed you where those strong trade winds were. We've now seen our Southern Oscillation Index start to rise over the last month, and now it is sitting here. Now, how do you read this? If we are below minus seven on this graph, we're talking about El Nino. If we are above seven, we're talking about a stronger La Nina, all right? But what are we looking at now? The stronger trade winds are not only pushing the main convective region right here, just north of Australia, where the trade winds are meeting this westerly wind burst, but they are allowing for that cooler water to really emerge. Now, as I've been talking about in long range updates, we need to watch the warmth in the North Pacific versus the La Nina emerging here. These two pieces will be most critical for understanding weather across the United States throughout the rest of summer. We're going to keep that discussion going this Wednesday. To finish this up, Europe, much of Western Europe, very, very warm, while north of the Black Sea, we're looking at anywhere between a four to eight degrees Celsius cooler than average pattern moving up uh, through that area. Dry from the Iberian Peninsula all the way through parts of Central Europe, but as we get over two parts of Ukraine and into the Russian wheat belt, we're seeing near average to wetter than average conditions over the next 10 days as forecast by the European model. To finish this up in South America, where we grow the majority of the safrina crop, precipitation patterns look normal to slightly wetter than average. And we did get a good deal of rainfall that came through parts of southern Brazil about a week ago. The forecast moving forward shows a lot of rain for like Rio Grande do Sol, but this is not enough rain and it is too late to undo the major drought stresses we saw earlier and, uh, in the year. Harvest efforts may be slowed down by some rain in Argentina as we look forward in this forecast as well. Okay, that's all I got for you today. Hope you all have a great rest of your week. I look forward to talking to you each day this week. Have a good one. Thank you.